Welcome back to Echo Ridge and to another episode in our dumpster fire with a whole lot of temporary solutions. And today, we're just going to add more to them. We have quite a few things to discuss. First, I've incorporated another system in our open air sauna, and I'm quite happy with it. We've added a liquid shutoff and a liquid pipe thermal sensor to this loop. Now, whenever the water is less than 25 degrees, it'll be sent right back into the loop. We're doing this to sort of conserve water. As it was previously designed, the water would come from the polluted water geyser on the other planetoid, circle through here once, and then head off over to this tank. Very inefficient. Now the thermo sensor sees if it's cold enough to go back through the system based on a desired overall temperature of about 25 degrees, and if it's good, it'll send it right back through with its first stop being the metal refinery. If the metal refinery needs coolant, it gets filled up first, and then all of its overflow come into this bridge system where the overflow will take priority from the incoming polluted water. Which, by the way, we're in the process of adding even more buffer tanks, because yes. So we need to add a few more pipes to make use of all these extra buffer tanks, but doubling the amount of buffer tanks from 10 to 20 should offset the fact that we will not be using as much water as we were before because this system is now a whole lot more efficient. As you can see, most of the water coming through is going to be going through multiple times. And when the metal refinery is not running, well, this very cold water is going to be able to go through the loop 10, 20, 30, who knows how many times before it warms up to the point where we no longer want to use it as coolant. Now, right now, we're still using the standard liquid pipes but i think it's about time to put in some radiant liquid pipes because i now have about three tons of cobalt so i think i'll add radiant liquid pipes where the heat sources are the most significant which is basically every building that creates heat i'm also going to add some right by these gas reservoirs because they are holding the very hot natural gas even though gas isn't very good at spreading its temps, so we shouldn't ever really see a problem. I'm also considering extending some sort of, you know, temporary cooling solution throughout our base until the time comes that we can run a steam turbine. Right now, there are no issues, and as long as we're not making this water any hotter than the 25 degrees, we shouldn't really see a problem. The only catastrophic temperature issue that we could run into right now is are dust caps, and they can keep growing till 35 degrees. But that sort of brings us back to our horse and cart situation. There's quite a few things that are locked behind your ability to get plastic, namely in the form of heat deletion. In this case, it's because I want to tap into some of these refined metals. Eventually, it'd be nice to get some geothermal power, not to mention every bit of tier four research requires plastic in order to be able to create data banks at the Orbital Data Collection Lab. So then I started thinking about the goals of the colony. What if we just never got plastic? We sort of get stuck in these ruts when playing oxygen not included of we have to do A, then B, then C, but then you start thinking, says who? We have a source of cooling for our colony in the form of this cool slush geyser. So maybe that's our quote unquote plastic solution. Yeah, there's a lot of things we wouldn't be able to do that are very nice to do. Everything from being able to create steam turbines all the way up to just being able to create plastic ladders. But the cooling itself, we don't necessarily need the steam turbines and the plastic for, considering we have polluted water coming out at minus 10 degrees. Which makes me wonder, could this much water tame something like a gold volcano? Of all the volcanoes, Gold is pretty much the easiest to tame, but that's still a whole lot of heat. And if we did end up using that polluted water in order to cool this as much as possible, we'd then lose the ability to keep our open air industrial sauna cool, and eventually our base would overheat. And there have been plenty of folks in the comments saying, just open it up, especially in a cold area like this, and considering there's a bunch of water here, you'd have access to refined gold for quite some time before the heat would end up becoming a problem. And that's definitely one way to do it, it's just not the way I plan on doing it. And that's for the simple reason that you eventually have to deal with the heat coming out of the volcano. I don't need refined metals anymore because I have a nice metal refinery giving me all the metals I need. Well, at least until I run out of ore. Especially considering I don't plan on feeding or ranching these plug slugs until I get that renewable source of refined metal. 
Yes, I know I could feed them ore as well, but that is a truly limited resource, and I don't want to tap into that yet either. Which brings us back full circle to what we've been talking about in the past couple episodes. Without any oil on this planetoid, or this planetoid, we need to go find a Dreco. But I'm sort of taking my time in this playthrough a little bit, sort of relaxing and sipping on my tea, and not necessarily trying to make a grind out of it. So I think this episode is going to be all about cleaning up this planetoid as much as possible and getting it ready for a future space program. We've been doing some sweeping all around the colony. We've also been knocking out some research, which by the way, this is the last bit of clean water we have on the planetoid. As you can see, research is sort of stalled at the supercomputer because we don't have any water to put into it until I enable this pitcher pump. Yeah, we have 17 tons of regolith and four tons of sand, but once again, I'm taking my time and want to have a confirmed method for being able to create more sand, which is another one of those things we're putting on the back burner. What I think I will do in the meantime is set up a water sieve solution that only cleans so much of the polluted water because we don't need too much water, just enough to get through research. So maybe we start with a hydro sensor that says, once the water is up to this point here, stop adding more water. And while we've done a fantastic job of keeping this water clean, in fact, it might be the only clean thing on this planetoid, that's about to change. Because I rather like this system here, and I'd rather not be doubling our efforts when it comes to where we're creating this polluted dirt. Not for any big particular reason, it's just something, once again, that I want to try. And here's how that new system is going to look. When this hydro sensor sends out a green signal, and it'll do that as long as the water is not above 800 kilos, it'll send a green signal to this liquid shutoff and both of these vents. The vents do two different things. The first one is the output for the salad spinner converting mud to dirt and water at a priority of four. The second one is taking all of our bathroom water out of this system, which you might be thinking, Echo, that's a bad idea for a couple reasons. One, the germs, but two, isn't it eventually gonna take all the water from your bathroom where eventually the lavatories and the sinks and the showers won't have any clean water? Well, yes, it would. That's why we put this liquid shutoff in. Whenever this vent is active, it means we're draining fresh water from our bathroom system, which means we need to add more water to it and we're doing that by taking the polluted water from this tank and sending it into our bathroom system which means for every 10 kilos of water we're taking out of the bathroom we're adding 10 more kilos back in the only disadvantage of the system that i have found so far is because we are charging the polluted water pipe it means there's always going to be overflow heading into these thimble reeds not too big of a deal because two thimble reeds don't drink too much polluted water and Let's face it, we have an infinite source of polluted water, so I'm pretty happy with it. Speaking of water, over on Topio Rallon, the inevitable has happened and our solar panels are entombed. But because it's only oxalite coming down here, this oxalite is eventually going to dissipate into the vacuum of space, unentombing the solar panels. And we have so many beautiful batteries here, we'll have plenty enough power to continue running this liquid pump until the oxalite dissipates, so no big deal there. Also on the waterfront, we're down to 16 tons of algae. And since we're cleaning this place up, we're producing less polluted oxygen, which means it's probably about time to start getting working on a spawn. You may remember when we did the initial math, based on the average output of this cool slush geyser, we decided we were going to be able to support 12 duplicates. But now that we're using natural gas as our primary power source, we're also getting another renewable source of polluted water that I think we should take into account just to see if it changes the numbers with any sort of significance. So we're going to bring up our handy dandy calculator and we'll start by looking at this cool slush geyser and we know that it gives us 1430 grams per second. So 1430 grams per second times 600 seconds in a single cycle gives us a total of 858,000 grams or another way to look at that is 858 kilos per cycle. We'll keep that number on the back burner. What we're going to do to figure out the average output of water from these natural gas generators is take a look at their properties. Notice in the last five cycles, they've been active for 14% of the time. And yes, all four become active at once because they're all tied to the same smart battery. 
so we know each of these have been active the same amount of time. We also know that for every second they are active, they are producing 67.5 grams of water. So you can probably see where we're going with this. I also wanted to note that you can see that this cycle and last cycles percentages are much higher, and that's because we've been running more gold amalgam through our metal refinery in anticipation of building our spawn. But I don't have any big problem with using, say, 15% as our average output, at least to start with. Because as our colony gets older, it's only going to be using more power. So with an average uptime of 15%, we can take 0.15 and times it by 600 seconds in a cycle. And we now know that these natural gas generators have been running on average of 90 seconds every cycle. Which brings us back to the fact that we know they're producing 67.5 grams per second. We can multiply this 90 by 67.5 and we get an average output of 6,000 grams per second from each natural gas generator. Well, we have four natural gas generators, which gives us a total additional output of water of 24 kilos. So we can take that 24,300 grams from our natural gas generators add it to the 858,000 grams from our polluted water geyser and we get a total of 882,000 or 882 kilos. We divide this by 600 to get our per second rate back and you can see it hasn't changed that much from our water geyser. So yes, the natural gas geysers do add water, but in this case it only averages out to be about 40 grams per second. So what we're looking at for total water input is 1.47 kilos, which brings us the bad news. We know the electrolyzers require one kilo per second in order to provide 188 grams per second of oxygen, or another way to look at it is 8.88 duplicates. Bringing up our calculator again, if we round down just to make sure we're safe on water to 1.4 kilos per second, and know that for each kilo we're producing enough oxygen for 8.88 duplicates. That gives us enough for 12.4 duplicates. So we went through that exercise and we learned that even with four natural gas generators running as much as they are, it's still not even enough to produce enough water to support one more duplicate. So we're gonna stay with 12. Speaking of which, I know you've been noticing that the printed pod's been active this entire episode and I've been getting around to it. I found a pretty good duplicate which I was torn about because I really do enjoy these citrus spandex suits. But this Ellie here is great at supplying, tidying, and building. They have early bird and their only negative is gastrophobia. Welcome to the colony, duplicate number 11, Chris Hoffler. With Chris coming on board, we know we have enough cots, but I do need to add another mess table, which means this is gonna get awfully ugly for a minute because <laughs> Our laboratory above it and our mess hall are not going to be even steven actually wait a minute we don't need this water cooler we're never going to drink from it and we can get access to the party line phone pretty easily which that'll free up one space and then we can get rid of this flower pot and also get access to glass bowling so we can get these arrow pots and we'll have enough space for all 12 of our eventual duplicates here we go and after a little bit of research, we now have our diamond arrow pots, which we have 11 tons of diamonds, so I'm not too concerned about using these awesome decor items. I also got rid of the sour lemons. Well, because they don't have much to be sour about these days. Everything's looking great. Unfortunately, though, that means I have to design a new mess hall. And I think we're going to go with, like, the subway and diner checkers. Doesn't that look much better now? I don't know who they're going to be talking to on the party line phone because there isn't another one in any of our colonies, but, you know, it's good practice, I suppose. While I was giving the Great Hall a makeover, we seem to have run out of water. We have more coming in because that volcano is active, but this reminds me of another point. As soon as we start using all of this water that's coming in and putting it into electrolyzers, we're not going to have any more water for this system, or at least not a lot. So I think I'm going to start recycling the polluted water. Granted, this is 25 degrees, but if we mix it in with the other water as it's going through here, it might allow us to back up on our water. Once again, I really do think I make a lot of things way more complicated than they need to be. 
but I don't like doing the same systems over and over. And I think this will be just as fun. After thinking about it for a second, I definitely have to prioritize the water that we need to feed back in to our bathroom system when we're taking it out. So why don't I just have it on overflow, something like this. I can add a couple more bridges here, expertly placed, and then just have it join here with a 50-50 split. Now it will raise the overall temperature, not only of this area, but it'll still average out to be decent because this water comes in so very cold. I will still bridge it on to make sure that we are prioritizing this water here. And that way it'll only add to the system when this geyser is no longer erupting. And I did it again. I thought I had enough carbon dioxide built up here that it would stifle the off-gassing of this polluted water. Unfortunately, it was not enough. So when I cleaned up all the water, all the polluted oxygen started off gassing and then stifling these dust caps. Not a big deal, we're at 90,000 calories and I'm making a new mushroom farm over here. With that being said, we are gonna start burning through a lot of our sand and regolith when we start using this water to power those electrolyzers. So probably next episode is when we're gonna crack the infinite sand issue. Also on the waterfront, we need to remember that we have plenty of polluted mud. We haven't even started using the sludge press on it, which is going to give us a lot of polluted dirt. We could be taking all that polluted dirt and putting it into sublimation stations, which I'm fairly confident is what most people who start this map do. I don't know why I'm taking it all and turning it into regular dirt. I just don't want to use the sublimation station this time. In deciding where I'm going to place our half spawn, I think we're going to go somewhere here in the middle. It'll give us decent access to be able to plug the hy watt wire in. Actually, I already have all that coolant coming through here. So it might be smart to put it over here somewhere. Then we'll also have access to the heavy watt wire for any sort of extra power that we're going to be getting from the hydrogen generators. Question is, do I have enough room over here to build it? Guess we're going to find out. In this case, we're going to be building a half a spawn because we're never going to have more than 12 duplicates on this colony and a half spawn can support 16 duplicates well two electrolyzers which technically can get you all the way up to 17.6 but i don't like to run it that close i just realized it would help if i actually researched the electrolyzer and this is the general design i'm going to give a shot i don't think we need any power transformers because i think one conductive wire will do it i'm also betting on the fact that i can get away with two hydrogen generators considering we're running half as much as we normally are there's our power in now Next up, we'll do some automation, starting with the hydrogen generators. Then we'll put an Atmo sensor up here, and I think we can get away with just one Atmo sensor as well for the oxygen. And then it's time for the ventilation, but we're also gonna need to include some cooling. So I think this is all gonna be radiant down here. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna look quite yet, because if I start cooling all that oxygen off, just flat out with this polluted water, I am afraid of how hot it's going to get. We're gonna try it anyways, but going in, that is my fear. We'll see how hot this area gets, but the cooling can come in just like this, and then we can rejoin everything else down here. We're also gonna fill all this up with some cobalt metal tiles because cobalt is everything that is beautiful in the world and an excellent conductor of thermals, which means I'm gonna need more cobalt. So let's get a quick, uh, maybe 25? Our half spawn is about there. I finished up the coolant pipes here. You can see that the water is sitting around 15 degrees. And that's because our very cold water is averaging with our about 28 degree water coming out of our storage tank. But why aren't we moving? Uh oh, what I do? There must be one too many blobs of water in here because I built this bridge system just to keep it flowing. And that way it continues to radiate around. Otherwise the whole system is gonna have to wait until this is warm enough, and that could be a little while. I suppose I could put the overflow on the other direction. Oh, I see now. It's the water being pumped up out of this pump. It's what made it too full, which is not too big of a deal. And I did this on purpose because if the thermals of this water, for instance, right now it's sitting at 20 degrees, that means it could actually be used as a coolant. And I didn't want to waste it, again, trying to make it as efficient as possible, but what I think I can do is enable this liquid shutoff every once in a blue moon when this liquid pipe thermal sensor is not running. And we can do that by going to find a timer sensor 
We have the cycle sensor. Where's my timers? There it is. Never mind. And since green overrides red, we don't need an OR gate or anything like that. Oh, I think it'd look better down here. And we can just hook it up that way. We could also hook it up this way, but I think this is cleaner and it's easier to understand, making it look like they're coming from two different lines. And I've set this on run green for five seconds every third of a cycle. So I'll reset the timer. It allows the liquid shut off to turn on and we'll empty some of this coolant for the sole purpose of keeping this water flowing. And now notice because of the timer sensor emptied some water from this loop, it will continuously flow until such a time that the natural gas generators have created enough water and liquid pump forces the coolant loop to be a little bit too full. A third of a cycle later, it'll turn it on, empty just five blobs out. Yes, I like that solution a lot. All right, where was I talking about the spawn? It had to be the coolant here. Our water is coming in all the way from this tank and it's gonna plug right in to the system that we described before. Once this water gets a little too low, the hydro sensor is gonna fire a green signal, allowing us to turn more of this polluted water into clean water using our bathroom water sieve. Ventilation looks pretty similar. We have two gas pipes going through, both getting cooled about the same amount of time. This is 16 tiles of cooling, and this is 20 tiles of cooling. We'll see how effective this is after a little bit. I just realized I'm gonna have to incorporate this into the overall loop system. Otherwise, this coolant is not gonna be rotating with the rest of it. What do I do? Oh, this is easy enough. I'll just onboard the water much further lower, separate it there, and then the coolant can come out right after the metal refinery. Also means I'm not gonna need this system here. I can get rid of these bridges and then the flow control will come from here. Think this is gonna work? Let's get some coolant emptied because I have to take out the water from this line here to allow the whole thing to sort of catch up. There we go. That's now working as intended. As the standard, our, the other gas pipe is for our hydrogen and we have the standard system here. It backs up through here and any sort of overflow is going to head all the way down to this hydrogen generator that is just going to burn it clean. just realized I might want a little bit more here. Uh, it should be fine. I was thinking about bringing this pipe up even further, but this should be plenty of backlog. Now to start off with, we're not going to be feeding those hydrogen generators at all. We are going to be venting it because it's all oxygen in there. With the water ready to go, all we're waiting on is some power, and I think we can go the cheap way out and just put a manual generator here. That should be plenty to be able to kickstart this system. While I'm getting the spawn online, I wanted to show you that I made a modification to our backup system for these buffer tanks. Remember we said that whenever these tanks got low enough, we were just gonna bridge on this polluted water to supplement the water coming from here that was gonna average out to 15 or whatever. Well, I've decided to use a little bit of automation coming from this liquid reservoir. Whenever this reservoir becomes less than 80% full, it's going to send out a green signal. When it does, it's going to turn this liquid shutoff on, which will then allow some of this polluted water to backfeed the whole system. For such a small colony, we've managed to get a pretty complicated but pretty efficient water system installed here. I'm very, very happy with it. Well, at least until I find its flaws. Our spawn is now off of wheel power and seems to be doing just fine. I'm going to have to keep an eye on it though, because I'm not 100% sure that the values will stay the same at 250 and 450, only because there's still only one hydrogen gas pump in the half spawn, but there's two less oxygen gas pumps. So we might have to make this gas pump a little less aggressive. But until I start seeing hydrogen in the oxygen lines, I'm not going to worry about it too much. On the temperature side of things, we won't know for a little while because it's going to take this spawn a little bit of time to heat up significantly. But right now, the coolant's coming in at 20 degrees and exiting at 21. So liquid is doing what it's supposed to do and completely overriding the gas dumps coming out. Now, before we close this thing up, I'm going to make sure we Azar doesn't yell at me in the comments by putting some nice drywall in our spawn system. And I did just unlock the wonderful aqua plaid print, so that's what we're gonna go with. And to their credit, it really does look a lot better. Now, the decor is completely wasted because all these machines destroy it, but it still makes me smile. Last up is starting our spaceport. 
and I was a little discouraged when I discovered that the roof is right here. So what we're going to do is go down just like this, and you can see from the very top of where it looks like the atmosphere ends, it's only 32 tiles. I like to have a good 40 tiles of space. Now you can get away with some 35 tiles of height at the start of your rocket program, but I also wanted to put a nice meteor collection system into this playthrough, so I'm going to go even more aggressively and maybe bring it all the way down here at 50. And this will also give us the advantage of having the satellite up top, which I think is going to look pretty cool. The disadvantage is, with this much atmosphere being around here, when the rockets do take off, it's going to pull a little bit behind the points like this. Now it'll quickly go away, but we're just going to have to be careful. We also have to make sure that there's a good barrier between our colony itself and the rocket program, because otherwise those rockets will end up heating everything up. So where's a good in-between point? I'm not really sure. I suppose first things we'll do is find out how low this vacuum of space goes. And we'll do that just by doing some wonderful diggy digs, which is once again going to drop some water and make our base that was starting to look nice a little worse. Give me a few minutes to clean all this up and I'll show you what we come up with. Uh, time out. What happened here? And why is there some delicious meat? It's a little warm, but I think we can go in there and get it. Oh boy. What happened is we literally melted the sedimentary rock insulated tile, so we're gonna need to be smarter about it. How hot do you think it'll become here if I just let all this molten gold just come down here in the atmosphere? It'll be okay, right? And then we'll reseal it in? Yeah, this is gonna be okay. The dupes aren't gonna get scalded or anything, don't you worry. Of course, we only have 0.7 cycles to do it because it's gonna start erupting again. Let's not mop this up. Okay, well, that worked. We're down to 0.6 cycles. I told you gold wasn't too difficult to manage. This time we'll use igneous rock, just like this. And we have 0.3 cycles remaining. Let's see if they can do it in time. What do you think the chances are that they're gonna build themselves into the volcano? Just in case, we'll open it up here. 45 seconds. Mason Lord has seen better days. Unfortunately, Callie called dibs on the triage cot first. But look at this, we had 20 seconds to go. And we managed to get a bunch of refined gold. And it's not that warm here. Well, hopefully we don't stifle our dust caps. We've come to the part of the planetoid that had some brine ice, so it started to melt. And as you can see, we have a lot of brine water. I don't want to deal with it. So I think what I'm going to try to do is just corner build it and destroy it. Yeah, it's a little wasteful, but it's not like there's a lot of brine for me to work with. It does look like, as the standard where the neutronium stops is sort of where the planetoid creation engine makes the beginning of the atmosphere, even though it does sort of ebb and flow. So I need to come to a decision of where I'm going to start our rocketry program. Uh, well, never mind. Uh, apparently there was some mud up there and now we have brine all over the place. Oops, I did it again. Well, I think we just solved our sand problem. I didn't realize the oxalite meteors came occasionally with regolith. That's a lot of sand, although it's a little warm and now it's heating everything up. This is why we can't have nice things. I'm instantly gonna dig it up and that way it, at the minimum it becomes half as much mass so it'll transfer half as much heat. Well after a few short cycles we've got everything dug out. Only thing left to do is now go around picking everything up because we've dropped a lot of stuff. Not a big deal. Now this wreck satellite is causing some problems because well it's right next to our main ladder rung so we're just gonna demolish it. No big deal. About the only other features I've installed is our ice storage. Because all this ice is sitting on neutronium and it's in a vacuum of space, it will never melt. So anytime we need ice, we'll have plenty available. And all we do is make sure no one can go through this door and keep this automatic dispenser on grabbing all the liquefiables in a non-sweep fashion. And then over here, we have a bottle emptier that's gonna drop off all the liquids we don't want, such as brine. And then over here, I have some regolith storage that's being dropped right here on this metal tile. Remember, if you will, that metal tile is what cools down our molten glass. Well, in this case, any regolith we find on the surface is going to be put onto this little metal tile and instantly cooled down. You can see already we have over 60 tons of regolith and it's between 33 degrees and minus four. That'll work in a pinch. I'm gonna let the dupes 
pick all this stuff up, maybe do some more digging, but I think that's going to about call it for today's episode. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments below and what you might have done differently. You know, besides the whole opening up a volcano filled with a bunch of molten gold. So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.